Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Michael Kugelman. Michael is the Wilson Center Asia Program's Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia. He joins us to provide an update on the latest from Afghanistan. And Michael, lots going on. Once we had a, 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 an agreement, we thought there were reasons for optimism, but it's taken a dark turn. Tell us what's happening. Yeah, you're right. A lot happening and none of it is good. Um, essentially, uh, back on uh, May 12th, there was a, just a horrific attack on a maternity ward uh, in a hospital in Kabul that targeted uh, newborn babies and their moms. And uh, it was a mass casualty event. And uh, once that happened, the uh, Afghan government essentially announced that it was going to go back on the offensive uh, against the Taliban, uh, essentially signaling that, at least for now, it was putting off efforts to launch a formal peace process between the Afghan government and the Taliban, which had been put in, which had been set into motion uh, almost three months ago when the U.S. government and the Taliban concluded an agreement that was meant in part to create what was described as an intra-Afghan dialogue, formal peace talks. And uh, in recent days, there have been more attacks, more terrorist attacks. Um, there have been offensives waged by the Taliban including a brief uh, attack on a major city, uh, the northern city of Kunduz. So unfortunately, at this point, we are back to square one. Certainly, peace is not dead. The peace process is not dead. But I would argue that it really is dead in the water, at least for now. It's certainly easy to second guess. But was it a mistake for the U.S. and the Taliban to negotiate without the Afghan government at the table? Well, certainly that, that's a valid criticism because you're, you're making so many uh, major uh, commitments and uh, to coming to an agreement without the involvement of the government where the war is, uh, is taking place. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is that was what had to happen. The U.S. really wanted to um, get an agreement with the Taliban uh, that would entail uh, a, a, a schedule for a withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan. Uh, and the U.S. wanted to set in motion a process leading to, a, to, a, to peace talks. And the way it was laid out is that the Taliban had said, OK, uh, we'll be happy to, um, to have talks with the Afghan government, but only after we have talks with you, meeting the U.S. first, and bilateral talks with you uh, in order to negotiate a, a troop withdrawal. And, you know, let's, let's be quite candid here. I mean, the U.S. doesn't have a lot of leverage in this game. President Trump really wants to get out of Afghanistan. He wanted to have some type of agreement with the Taliban, which he could use to say, OK, we got our agreement with the Taliban. Now we're ready to pull forces. So, in effect, the U.S. did not have the choice of, of not including uh, the Afghan government in that negotiation. It knew that the only way it could get a deal with the Taliban was that if it had uh, negotiations with the Taliban that were bilateral and that did not, did, not, did not involve the Afghan government. This would seem to put the U.S. in a bind because now you can't walk away and say, okay, we fixed it, both sides are talking, we did our part, it's time for the U.S. to withdraw. Seems like the opposite is the scenario right now. Yeah, exactly. And you know, understandably, there was a lot of unhappiness in Kabul about the U.S. Taliban deal because it really did not commit the Taliban to doing much at all. I mean, essentially all it said in the agreement was that the Taliban would have to uh, sever all ties with international terror groups on Afghan soil. So we're essentially talking about Al-Qaeda, which is already a shell of its former self, and ISIS, the Islamic State, which is actually a rival um, of, of the Taliban. And in return, the U.S. had basically agreed to withdraw all forces from Afghanistan by the spring of 2021, so long as the Taliban does what the deal had, accepted, had uh, committed it to do. Now, there's been a lot of talk about uh, secret annexes of the agreement, uh, dimensions of the agreement that were never made public, but that were a part of the broader negotiation. Very few people have, have seen these so-called annexes, and those that have essentially say that um, and there's not much else that's, that's, that's really there. It's still a weak agreement from a U.S. perspective. Um, so, so yeah, this, this has really put the U.S. in a tough position. I think it's going to be very easy for the government, for the, for the U.S. government's rivals to essentially paint that deal between the U.S. and the Taliban as a surrender deal more than anything else. Is it clear what the Taliban ultimately wants? No. Uh, and we ask the question a lot. What does the Taliban really want? The only thing we know that the Taliban wants, which has been in its messaging consistently for years, that it, is that it wants U.S. troops, it wants all U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. It wants all foreign troops out of Afghanistan. Beyond that, we don't know. I mean, the Taliban has claimed in recent years that it welcomes 
the opportunity to negotiate with the Afghan government in the hopes of coming up with some type of political settlement. But the Taliban has been very vague as to what it would be willing to agree to. Uh, it has said only that uh, any type of settlement would have to be in accordance with Islamic law, which is a very vague, broad statement. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the Taliban has consistently vowed to destroy the political system uh, as we know it in Afghanistan. It's consistently vowed to overthrow elected Afghan governments, or pardon me, to, um, yeah, to overthrow Afghan governments, elected Afghan governments through violence. So I think the big fundamental question, which no one has provided an answer for, is this. Would the Taliban really be willing to negotiate a political settlement that would entail it having to um, work, having to work from within the very political system and with the very politicians that it has long vowed to, uh, to overthrow and destroy. I don't think we, any of us have an answer for that. We just don't what know. What do the That's people the within the on. government think? And, and, you know, if actions speak louder than words, it doesn't appear that the Taliban is willing to accept the government as legitimate. Do people within the government believe they can actually negotiate in good faith? People within the Afghan government? Yes. With the Taliban. Do they believe they could have good faith negotiations with the Taliban or do they ultimately suspect that the Taliban will not accept their existence under any circumstances? There's a lot of skepticism, uh, not just within the Afghan government, but within the broader uh, Afghan political class about this notion of the Taliban really being committed to peace. There's a lot more, there's a lot more optimism uh, among U.S. officials than there is among Afghan officials. And for good reason. I mean, the Afghan officials have seen just how, how much uh, the Taliban has done to tear apart that country and to wage uh, relentless violence. Uh, the Taliban has refused to reduce or pause its violence ever since it got the deal with, with the U.S. All that the Taliban has done is pledged to stop attacking U.S. troops and U.S. targets in Afghanistan. So I, I do think that um, eventually the Afghan government will come around to the, the need to at least try to negotiate with the Taliban simply because there's no other option. I mean, the war cannot be won militarily. And of course, with U.S. troops uh, heading for the exits, uh, you know, the, the battlefield advantage increasingly goes to the Taliban. So I think that the peace process is seen as the only option. It's the least bad option, but that doesn't make it a good option. And has Ramadan or the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, epi pandemic, have either of those had any impact on the actions of the Taliban? Well, unfortunately, no. Uh, you know, the Taliban has demonstrated no desire to, uh, to agree to any type of short-term truce during Ramadan or the Eid holiday, for that matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think if anything, if there's any impact that the pandemic could have on where things are going, it's that if, if it gets really bad, if the pandemic gets really bad in Afghanistan, that could cause President Trump to decide to accelerate the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan. If he thinks that our troops are susceptible to the, uh, to the virus, you know, that could be a, a good pretext for him to, to use and saying, well, we got to, we really got to pick up the pace of withdrawals. I think that he definitely benefits from a political perspective of bringing home as many troops as he can before our election uh, in November. As we try to anticipate next steps or next developments, uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of daylight in the scenario you're describing, uh, but do you see any openings, do you see any possibilities for progress? I don't. Uh, I mean, so long as you continue to have this upsurge in violence and attacks in Afghanistan, there's just a lot of public anger, understandably, and there's a lot of uh, government anger in Afghanistan about the fact that you continue to have this upsurge in violence. Uh, we don't know for sure who was behind the, the hospital, uh, that horrible hospital attack. It seems more likely ISIS was behind it than the Taliban, but the Taliban continues to carry out horrific attacks. And I think that for Afghanistan's government, the fact that the Taliban has simply been unwilling to agree to any type of reduction in violence, I think that could really, uh, that could really doom things. The U.S. is giving it one last um, attempt, one last effort to try to push the sides to, uh, to agree to talk. But um, I think at least in the immediate to, mid to midterm, very little hope that we'll have a peace uh, process. And even if one starts, getting it to a successful outcome would be even more difficult. So unfortunately, not a lot of optimism to go around. Well, you know, we can't force an ending on an up note when there is no up note. So thank you for, for sharing with us the latest. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again, Michael. My pleasure. Thank you. Hope you stay well during the lockdown, you and your family.
Thanks. Neither Thanks to all done. of you joining us for this edition of Wilson Center Now, either via the podcast or via the, the TV or the video version. We hope you enjoyed it and that you'll join us again. We'll stay with you and uh, we'll have plenty more content coming your way. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.